Let's turn together to hymn number five, All People That on Earth Do Dwell. And let's stand to sing. This morning as we begin, we light a lamp to remind us that a light shines in the darkness and the darkness could not overcome it. God bids us all come to worship. Whatever your age, gender, sexual orientation, race, socioeconomic status, or abilities, God welcomes you into relationship. And I welcome you to be in this space, to be in relationship with God and with each other. As we begin our worship today, I want to respectfully acknowledge that the land on which we worship is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Attawandaran people who have lived here for time immemorial and who welcomed and partnered with our ancestors when they arrived on this, what is called the Haldeman Tract, a land that was granted to them um, for in perpetuity. Uh, 10 kilometers on either side of the Grand River from, for the whole extent. And they welcomed our ancestors here and partnered with them as they uh, settled here. Have you ever felt like you were on the outside looking in? No boys allowed or no girls allowed clubs. Or that you weren't old enough or athletic enough or good looking enough to get into whatever popular group you hope to be part of. It can be alienating to deal with that kind of exclusion. Unfortunately, religious institutions have been known to be exemplars in alienation and exclusion. This is not unique to modern day religious institutions. It was also part of Judaism back in Jesus' day. The sellers in the temples were gatekeepers 
of who was allowed in and who wasn't. No children, no unclean people, no one who couldn't afford to buy the animal sacrifices. In today's service, we plan to explore the scripture in which Jesus cleanses the temple. Don plans to look at Jesus' intent to make the temple more inclusive so that it could be a place for all nations to worship. In his sermon, he will wrestle with the observation that Jesus' followers made that Jesus' zeal for this vision of inclusivity would destroy him. But, as God often does, God reverses the destruction through the resurrection power of heaven to create a flood of healing and hope that can never be shut off. Now, it might be a bit ironic that in a service highlighting inclusivity, we have three white, settler, cisgender, heterosexual, middle-class, middle-aged, able-bodied men as the ones who are song-leading, worship-leading, and preaching. At least I'm pretty sure Chuck and Don were middle-aged at one point. (laughs) The groups with whom I identify with have been the least marginalized and least excluded groups throughout most of history with maybe one exception, 500 years ago during the Reformation when the Anabaptists were persecuted. Somehow, humanity has always found ways to highlight the differences between their group and the other. Rarely do people highlight the similarities. I experienced one of those instances last Sunday night. I jumped on Zoom to listen to Tanya and Tillich speak about their journey with a medically complex disabled child. One of the things that struck me about their sharing was the highlighting of the similarities between able-bodied and disabled people. She referred to Caden's wheelchair as a mobility device and then went on to suggest that bicycles and cars are also mobility devices that many, if not most of us, use. In fact, I would hazard a guess that many of us use some kind of mobility device to get here today. Maybe the differences that divide us are only part of our mental construct. Maybe there's more that's similar to others than any of us actually know. So how do we as Christians follow Jesus' example of creating an open and welcome for all people into God's family? Please join me in prayer. God of welcome and delight, when you stepped back to deserve all you had created, you declared it very good. Even now you stand with arms wide open to welcome everyone into your embrace. We confess our judgment of others different from us and our welcome of them has not been as generous as yours. Please give us the courage and the faith to follow Jesus in this fight for an inclusive, welcoming experience of humanity. We pray this in the name of the one who has welcomed everyone into God's inclusive kingdom. Amen. Great is the Lord is from our prior hymnal, so it will be projected as we sing. Let's stand.
I'd like to invite the junior youth and the children up to the front for children's time. And as you come up, I need to sort you into two groups. So if you come, your brown eyes or blue eyes? Blue? Okay, you can sit over here. What about you, Ron? Or, uh, sorry, Isaac, you can sit over there. And 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 you can sit over there. And, and, and you can sit over here. And you guys can sit over here. Okay. I think all you guys have blue eyes, right? Grayish? But they're not brown. Okay. Yeah, you got blue? Yeah, I got blue. Yeah, it, they look pretty blue. So we're all the blue-eyed people over here, and I think we put all the brown-eyed... Okay, oh, well, come on. You got blue eyes, too? Okay, sorry, I forgot to check you, but if you're blue-eyed, come on over here. Yeah, you. How, how do you feel about having blue eyes? Be. This happened? Yeah. But it's probably better than having brown eyes, don't you think? No? Well, maybe in a second you'll think it's better than having brown eyes. Because I got something for all the blue-eyed people here. <laughs> you guys like gum? No. <laughs> Do you want to pass it around, Trent? You don't want any? Okay, that's fine. You can take some if you like, if not. You know what? There's probably enough for two for each of the blue-eyed people. What do you guys think of that? Yeah, that'd be good. No, it wouldn't be. Oh, there's some mixed opinions. Why not, Anna Joy? They should have some. Oh, they should have some too? But they don't have blue eyes. So? It doesn't matter? <laughs> should we just invite them over here too? Okay, why don't you guys come on over? You have, oh, <laughs> well, what was it like for you guys to be sitting over there? I confess, I may have negated your demonstration a bit. I told them all I have mints, and they can come back with me to my pew and get mints afterwards. So there was someone, part of their group, who was going to help them out because the, the ruler of the other group wasn't going to be so kind to them. But, yeah. But did you guys feel a little left out? A little excluded? No. You could hear what was going on, and um, do you guys want some gum too? You can you can pass it around, and if you want to take some, you can take some. Do you guys think there's any? disadvantage to having brown eyes? No. You can see as well as your, with your brown eyes as we can with our blue eyes? No. Yeah. And do you, do you guys, um, are you any smarter or dumber than people with blue eyes? No. You guys are pr probably not any different at all, are you? What, what's the one thing that you guys can think of that we all have in common? 
even though our eyes aren't the same color. You can all see. You can all see, okay, yep. So that's one thing. What else? We all have eyes. You all have eyes, yeah. What are some things that you can't see that we all have in common? But you, you can't see, but you might know. You can't see the sky because there's a ceiling. You can't see the sky, but there's a ceiling, but we all live under the same sky. Yeah. Any other things? I was thinking about this on the, on the way, so I have a bit of an, ad, an advantage. What's beating inside of our chest right now? A heart, yeah. We, uh, we all have a heart. So no matter what color our eyes, or how tall we are, or how fast we are, or how smart, or what color we are, we all have a heart beating inside of us. Thanks for helping in this object lesson, and you can go back to your seats. Praise with joy the world's creator, number 428, echoes well the words of the children's story. This hymn uses the concept of the Trinity to ask us to free truth from our pride, a brilliant concept. Let's stand to sing. Our first scripture reading is from Mark 11, verses 11 to 18. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see whether perhaps he would find anything on it. 
When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Then they came to Jerusalem. And he entered the temple and began to drive out all those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He was teaching and saying, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. But you have made it a den of robbers. And when the chief priests and the scribes heard it, they kept looking for a way to kill him. For they were afraid of him, because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. And the second scripture passage happens shortly after the cleansing of the temple. From Matthew 21, verses 14 to 16. Now there was room for the blind and the crippled to get in. They came to Jesus, and he healed them. When the religious leaders saw the outrageous things he was doing and heard all the children running and shouting through the temple, Hosanna to David's son, they were up in arms and they took him to task. Do you hear what these children are saying? Jesus said, yes, I hear them. And haven't you read in God's word? From the mouths of children and babies, I'll furnish a place of praise. The word of the Lord. I want to acknowledge that this Sunday was to be Gary Harder's chance to preach. We had asked him and things changed. So we think of him this morning too. Wow, does Jesus ever let loose in the temple? Tables are overturned, coins are scattered, birds and animals destined to be sacrificed are driven out the door quickly followed by their owners chasing after them. This exercise of heavenly wrath actually started a few minutes earlier. We heard in our scripture reading that on the way to the temple, Jesus saw a fig tree with lots of leaves. Being hungry, he got his hopes up that there would be fruit to eat from its lush branches. But there were no figs. Christ lays a curse on the fig tree. May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And by the next morning, the fig tree had withered from the roots on up. Curiously, Mark adds a bit of commentary saying it actually wasn't the season for figs. Did Jesus know that? If so, that would seem to elevate the harshness of the curse. Poor fig tree. Does the cleansing of the temple and the cursing of the fig tree legitimize the use of destructive force? How should we interpret Jesus' all-consuming zeal and as his followers, what then is expected of us? What ought we to be doing? In our worship series for Lent, today we're focusing on the Monday of Holy Week. It's the day after the crowd had escorted Jesus into the city, waving palm branches. Those in the crowd sensed a tipping point, a moment ripe for revolt. 
a chance to incite the thousands gathered in Jerusalem for the Jewish Passover. Outnumbered many times over, the limited contingent of Roman soldiers stationed at the garrison wouldn't have stood a chance. When Pastor Mark preached two weeks ago, we noted that Jesus looked on the city with tear-filled eyes. He breathed a heavy sigh and said, How I wish you knew today what would bring peace but you can't see it. Seems he didn't want this to be a time for swords and bloodshed. And surely most people know that peace gained through violence never lasts. No, when Jesus looks at Jerusalem from that high vantage point, he saw something greater a moment that had the potential to unite long-standing enemies and awaken a new era of mutual concern for each other's well-being. Jesus saw a chance for lasting peace based on foes seeing their own security being dependent on the others. Imagine what could happen if not only the Jews and the Romans, but people from every nationality under the sun would find at God's house an experience of being seen and heard, resulting in an unrestricted outpouring of healing and hope. And from that experience, imagine a spirit of unity descending upon all people groups based on every person feeling valued, supported, and loved by the creator of all of life. And imagine a bond so great created over these people groups that it would inspire a community of kindness where each person commits to their neighbor having enough food, clothing, water, medicine, and meaningful employment. Is such a vision possible, or is it delusional? The miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 says, no, this vision is real, with 12 baskets full of leftovers even. The miraculous healing of the woman with the issue of blood says community can be restored and shame erased. The separate raising of three who had died, Jairus' daughter, the widow of Nain's son, and Martha and Mary's brother Lazarus, all say this vision is possible. Not even death can get in the way of it. Fired up with this vision, Jesus begins his Monday morning with a plan. He goes to he goes to pull a Samson move at the temple and push against the pillars, holding up a system that keeps people estranged from God. He's going to cause the roof to come crashing down on practices that exclude. And in the process, like Samson, he'll offer himself up and be consumed. All for the sake of returning the temple to its original purpose. And what is that purpose? Jesus quotes from the words we find in the prophet Isaiah's writing, chapter 56, verse 7. My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Sadly, over time, those in charge of God's house have let it turn into a marketplace and a corrupt one at that. People who have come to pray and lay their hearts open before God aren't getting in. They're being blocked by the high cost of having to exchange their money for the temple's currency. And they're also being price gouged by those selling the sacrifices the priests say are required to get God's attention. Sincere, humble people hurting people, desperate and afraid people 
are being turned away for a chance to be seen and heard. Well, enraged by these barriers, we know what happens when people, people speak up and complain, when they advocate for themselves and or others. They're labeled trouble, troublemakers by the institution. They may even find themselves ushered out by security or put on a, their names put on a list their access barred, maybe even for life. Oh, Jesus decides he cannot let this slide. Something has to be done, even if it consumes him, destroys him. The disciples are struck by his passion and are reminded of a quote by King David, zeal for your house will consume me. That quote comes from Psalm 69, verse 9. It's not clear what the situation was when David said these words. Is he on the run from King Saul? Or has he just been driven out of Jerusalem by his son Absalom? What we do know is that David has gone through many tough times. It could be any one of them. Times when he tried to do right by God, only to get pounded with curses by his enemies sometimes even by members of his own family. His commitment to prayerfully discern and do the right thing, even to show mercy to his enemies, feels like it is consuming him, eating him up from the inside out. Are we supposed to be impressed and inspired by such an example of loyalty and devotion? Or are these words reflective of someone who is misguided, perhaps self-absorbed, or worse, delusional? The easy-to-read translation Bible says that Christ's zeal for God's house will destroy him. And that word fits, because in John's gospel account of the cleansing of the temple, Jesus answers the Jews who ask him to prove his authority for doing what he did, and says, destroy this temple, and I will build it up again in three days. John provides a bit of commentary here, saying that Jesus was referring to his own body and that God would raise him to life after three days. And looking back on on Holy Week, indeed, that is what happened. But what if Jesus was saying to his critics something like this? Friends, don't be so attached to what you have built. Because truthfully, parts of it might be keeping people out. In fact, why don't you destroy it and see what happens? I guarantee that in as little as three days, God will bring to life a new version, one that more accurately reflects its original purpose. Why don't you destroy it? See what happens. Crazy, right? The Jews that had asked him to prove his authority thought he was referring to the building itself, a structure that had taken 46 years to be remade by King Herod. But I want you to look at what happens here. These offended Jews who asked Jesus to perform a miracle proving his authority actually get one right away. It doesn't take 46 years. It doesn't even take three days. It starts to happen minutes after Jesus has destroyed the market-like barriers. We heard from Matthew's gospel that the blind and the lame came into the temple and found healing. Is that not a sign? Is that not a miracle proving he has the authority to do this? I find it interesting that Matthew centers out the blind and the lame. People who can't see God's grace being held out to them. These blind souls creep through the entrance. They feel their way into the presence of God and suddenly 
Now they can see it. And they take hold of it. And people who are paralyzed by their fears, afraid that the Lord could never forgive their failings, crawl on hands and knees through that gate. They find strength and stand up and run into the arms of God. Friends, this, sim this simple act of overturning tables and shooing out the animals has opened the doors wide and people are coming in. Another observation. It seems the formerly blind and the formerly lame are keeping their healing on the down low. None of the Gospels speak about them celebrating, shouting praises to God. It's understandable, right? Wouldn't you be a bit nervous, worried we might get arrested, having skipped the rules about changing our money and offering up a sacrifice? Well, the adults may be quiet, trying to keep a low profile, but not the children. They are shouting, praise God for the son of David. Praise God for the son of David. They feel God is there. They feel something has shifted and for the better. And it's huge and they cannot keep quiet. I don't know what the temple policy was regarding children. I don't know if they were welcome inside there or not. What we do know is that their shouting was bothering the leading priests and teachers of religious law. It was probably both the volume and what they were saying, pointing to Jesus as the son of David. But the kids are not worried about what the priests and teachers think. They're focused on Jesus who has put them in touch with God they feel connected and blessed. They feel joy. They feel seen and heard and valued. And friends, these miracles and blessings all started happening within minutes of the temple being cleansed. Destroy this temple and watch how quickly it will be built again, Jesus said. Seems every generation runs into restrictions that bottleneck and block seekers courageously coming to bring their prayers and petitions to God. <clears throat> About 100 years ago, my grandmother Penner was kept from partaking in communion because of how she was baptized. She had declared her loyalty to Christ through water poured onto her head. But the church she had married into required immersion, a full body dunking. She was told she could only partake if she was rebaptized. And to that she said, no. She would not make a mockery of God's grace poured out for her at her baptism. Well, pastors and deacons came to visit and put pressure on her to be rebaptized, but she would not bow down. Now, I never heard how my grandfather responded. He would have been caught between a tradition of male headship and wanting to honor, honor his wife. In fact, his second wife, who not only married him, but had become the new mom to eight of his children. And then had four of her own with him. Grandpa owed her big time. <laughs> there was no way he could join the church in pressuring her. I don't know how long it took, but one day things changed, and Grandma was welcomed to the communion table. Some apologies were made, and she accepted them. 
I think for my parents' generation, the big issue constraining participation was the rule that only men could come to congregational meetings and vote on motions. I never heard if any tables were tossed to overcome that rule, but something happened and the congregation and the larger conference body let their temple be destroyed, calling on God to build it again in a more inclusive fashion. Oh, and then there was my generation, the baby boomers. In the 1970s, we reacted to being, there being too many unwritten rules defining what a Christian ought to look like. Boomers who wanted to stay in the church threw wrenches into the gears to disrupt tradition. Instead of suits and dresses, jeans were worn to church. Instead of clean-cut appearances and conformity, there were beards, long hair, higher hemlines, tie-dyed t-shirts, and guitars. In the end, those churches that wanted to include their youth recognized what had become barriers and they set them aside, which wasn't very easy to do for some. Well, after the boomers, subsequent generations have come up against other bottlenecks and barriers to inclusion. We continue to find that sexism has deeper roots than we thought. Racism too, for that matter. We continue to run into prejudice and discrimination, assumptions that value one person over another, be it based on wealth, education, disability, or sexual identity. We have only taken baby steps to appreciate how our being church has much work to do to dismantle and destroy assumptions that leave creation and its prayerful groaning outside our purview. Having said all that, we can be grateful for those who have given themselves to disrupt the patterns and pull down the pillars that open a way for our all to be welcome and to experience an eager God hearing their prayers and honoring their needs. Friends, the good news is this. When you experience the miracle of connecting with God personally, or witness it happening in others, where the blind begin to see and the lame are unable to walk. And once you hear the children shouting for joy, praising the presence and caring of the living God, then there is no going back for us. You will want to let go of your life. You will want to stop trying to protect it and conserve it. You will want to follow Jesus and put it all on the line, following as the Spirit leads, knowing these miracles are worth it. Yes, you will realize there is a cost. It is no small price to pay, but deep down you know it is worth it. Well, what would you say is narrowing the doors into God's presence today. Maybe it's not even a generational thing based on age differences. One thing I wonder about is if we sometimes fall into the trap of making our worship and life together too perfect, too scripted, too controlled, in a sense too much about us and not enough about being real. I wonder if sometimes we're all leaves, lush and shiny, but no fruit of God's power at work and our imperfections and neediness. I think about how hungry the world is for tasting and seeing that God is present, providing. That fruit, examples of God's faithfulness, would be so desired and so delicious. Well, as Pastor Janet pointed out to me this week, there is a price to pay for not having any fruit to share on account of being zealous for keeping God's house static and restricted. When we hang on to control, enforcing traditions that don't make sense, that keep people hungry and left on the outside, well, friends, this will destroy us. 
And so may God help us be open to learning from one another, especially from those who feel hindered and left out. Would you join me for a closing prayer? Dear God, to be honest, sometimes, maybe most of the time, we can't see you. We can't see you loving us. We are blind to your grace. Sometimes, maybe most of the time, we can't move our legs and get ourselves closer to you. We're paralyzed, scared stiff you won't find us good enough. Thank you, God, that today we heard a story that offers us a bit of courage to believe you actually love us as is. All thanks to Jesus, turning over tables, dumping rules that keep us outside the doors, that keep us from even trying to pray, that keep us doubting you, want, you won't want to hear about our hurts and troubles. <coughs> How amazing that Jesus let our hunger for love and meaning consume him. He welcomed us to trust you, and today we have this chance to see and walk and come closer. Here we are, Lord God. See us. Heal us. Raise us up into a life stronger than death. Set us free, and we will shout like those children in the temple. Cause us to bud and flower, pollinate our prayers, and let the fruit of your daily mercies and provisions hang in all fullness from our branches to be given away and shared with those who hunger to believe you really do exist and care about the world. Forgive us our narrow-mindedness and our control and destroy even the things we find precious, knowing that you will raise up a truer and better one suited for this day as an expression of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And so we commit to hold all things loosely so that you will find our hands responsive to share freely of the abundance we've already received. We commit this as our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Number 36, Let Us Build a House, is written by Marty Haugen, who has made 14 contributions to this hymnal. We Anabaptists love his theology. This one is a quest for uh, a healthy community, how to create a framework for a healthy community. Let's stand to sing.
we want to take time now to share from what is going on in the life of our community. First of all, I will just say that after church, you are certainly welcome downstairs for more conversation and engagement with uh, the service this morning and with Don's sermon. And there is Sunday School for Children as well. And next Sunday after church, there is a Sunday lunch potluck, a simple family-friendly potluck in a relaxed setting for any with interest to gather for conversation and good food after church. And a little addition to that, next Sunday we invite people to bring along board games to play after the meal. I would like to invite Ryan to come up for an announcement at this time. Yeah, I'm happy to announce uh, March 24th, we're going to have a progressive meal again. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with this, you don't have to be a progressive person to be part of this meal. And the idea is we move around uh, different places for, uh, for the different courses. So the first course would be 4 and then 5.30 and 7. And you don't have to go to all of them in case one is too early or too late. Uh, you can pick and choose. Um, so we need people to host and we need people to get, be a guest and eat as well. And also, if you're aware of someone that, that would like a ride or, or can't get around, maybe offer some rides to help organize that. And there's a sign-up sheet that explains a lot of the stuff. And uh, write your name down. If you have any questions, talk to me or Lori. And also, it's kind of supposed to be a surprise. So if you find out in your mailbox about the Thursday before the Sunday, we try to put the name or your, your route. Everybody has a different route. Try to keep it to yourself unless you really should tell somebody. But yeah, hope to see you sign up. And just also to note that Saturday, April 13th, is our SJMC Goods and Services and Talents Auction. This event will feature both live and silent auctions. Donation forms are in your mailboxes, and there's lots of information in the weekly newsletter. And online. And online. There's, you can do your donation online, too. So it's very convenient. We want to give thanks for the gifts that have been shared in so many ways this week, through prayers, through volunteer time, behind the scenes work, and financial contributions. Let's offer a prayer of gratitude. Thanks be to God. And I invite the ushers forward as we bless these gifts. to invite you now to share joys and concerns with the church community for prayer. And Chip, are you willing to uh, take the microphone around? If you have something to share, please raise your hand and Chip can uh, bring you the mic. I have a few updates that I would like to share. 
We are glad to report that Ruth Martin has been moved from Grand River Hospital to Freeport for rehab, and her husband, Kurt, who is still at Freeport, will be moving to Parkwood long-term care on Tuesday. So we are grateful that they are both moving into appropriate settings of care and that they actually were able to have a bit of a reunion at Freeport for the few days that they are both patients there. We are also glad to report that Helen Pierluigi will be moving to Trinity Village long-term care tomorrow. We want to remember her and sister Sue Chance, who is providing so much support. She's been a difficult set of movements and transitions for her. And she's also scheduled for cataract surgery this week on Wednesday, so there's a lot going on for her and a lot of moving parts to coordinate. And so we want to remember her and Sue. And we want to hold Henry and Karen Jansen and their family in our prayers. This past Thursday, Henry was admitted to Grand River Hospital for help in managing his cancer symptoms. And he's back home now and hoping to have a procedure done in hospital tomorrow that will offer more relief for his symptoms. And we continue to hold Gary and Lydia Harder in our prayers along with Mark and Rachel and the rest of their family. Gary was pretty stable this week and continues to receive excellent care at Hospice Wellington in Guelph. And he and Lydia have appreciated visits from family and close friends. It's been very good and it's also been tiring. So for all these people who are receiving care at pretty vulnerable times in their lives, for their families and their caregivers, we offer our prayers of love and support and caring. O oh Lord, hear our prayers. And we also want to express our condolences to the family of Linda Weber. Linda died this past Friday. She is a sister-in-law to Marcy Ninomia. Linda's funeral will be held here at St. Jacob's Mennonite Church this coming Saturday, March 9th at 11 a.m. And so we want to hold Marcy and the rest of the extended family in our prayers as they mourn Linda's death. And I also received a note just this morning. We just received word that Elmer Good died this morning at the Palmerston Hospital. Elmer was a brother of Alice Brubaker of our congregation. And Elmer grew up here in St. Jacob's. And so we want to remember Alice Brubaker and the extended family as they mourn his passing. So for these families who are grieving, we want to offer our prayers. O oh Lord hear our prayers. Is there anyone else who has anything they would like to share at this time? If not, then let's gather together our hearts uh, in prayer. God of love and mercy, we give you thanks and praise for all the ways your creative energy of renewal flows through our world and into the ordinary experiences of our lives. Help us to notice and appreciate each small wonder and encourage and strengthen small acts of kindness that keep that love flowing. As we gather together today, we offer prayers of confession where our thoughts and our hearts and our actions have excluded others, judged others, discriminated against others, where we have exploited and taken advantage of others and the earth we call home, we are sorry. When we have put rules and restrictions ahead of relationships, when we have made our faith too narrow, legalistic and transactional, when we have put up walls and barriers that block access to your unconditional love, when we have made you into a harsh, angry, punishing God who needs to be feared and appeased, we are sorry. We invite you to disrupt our habits and patterns that serve only our kind of people. We invite you to overturn our unfair assumptions and stereotypes and labels. We invite you to clear out our false gods of money and power and appearances and scatter our impulses towards greed, overconsumption, and self-indulgence. 
and help us make space for the people who want to draw near to you, who long to be heard and seen and known by you, who come to you seeking healing and hope. And we pray for people who are stuck in places of uncertainty and economic hardship. We pray for those on difficult journeys of illness, aging, and dying. We pray for those struggling with anxiety, depression, substance use disorder. And we pray for those debilitated by fear, anger, resentment, and despair. May your love break through and surround them. May your mercy give them what they need for today. And teach us the things that make for peace Teach us the things that welcome and break down barriers. Teach us to produce the fruit of love. And may this place be a house of prayer for all people. In your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 809, Sing a New Song into Being. Let's stand as we sing. Sing a new song into being, sound a And now receive this blessing. Go in peace, knowing that no matter your eye color or what groups you belong to or do not belong to, you are being welcomed into the wide open arms of God. Amen.